Hello and welcome to Chain Reaction, a new podcast series examining America's role in the world. I am your host, Aaron Stein, Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. Every two weeks, we'll talk to experts about a variety of topics and why it matters for U.S. foreign policy. On today's show, we talk to Mule about lessons we can learn from the Russian Aerospace Forces in Syria. A note of caution for listeners. <laughs> when plugging in my microphone, the recording device that we use didn't actually pick up my microphone, so this episode's audio quality may not be as high as the others. I apologize about that, but think the content is good enough to where we can still put it out. Thanks for understanding and tuning into the podcast. Hello and welcome. Today I'm talking to Mule, who was preparing for deployment to Jordan to command an operational support squadron and was previously deputy commander of the 336 Fighter Squadron. Mule, it's uh, good to have you back on the show you were on previously. Thanks, Aaron. Happy to be here. Yeah, why don't, before we start this conversation, uh, let's just get the disclaimer out of the way so uh, you, are, you are covered and, and we don't step on anything that will get you in trouble. That's great. So uh, to be clear, these views are mine alone and they don't uh, reflect the official policy or position in the Department of Defense of the United States government anyway. Well, okay. So now with that out of the way, let, 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 let's jump into it. You know, you and I have been like chatting sort of abstractly, and I thought it would just be fun to bring it onto the podcast, which is you know a topic that I don't, I just don't see very much like floating around, at least in the net in the national security space, which is you know, thinking about elements that our adversaries do pretty well and how we can steal some of those things to make ourselves even better. Did, did I frame that correctly? Does that encapsulate what we've been talking about? Yeah, I think you started driving towards it. Um, the way I look at it is it's a matter of uh, humility and uh, us kind of looking at our enemy, not to kind of look down at them or to completely unravel their plans, but to kind of learn uh, and become like a learning organism of some of the things that they're doing that are hugely asymmetric to our plan as a country uh, and the way that we develop our strategy. And they kind of know that um, as we've as we've really been able to look at that and just kind of blow it off and say, you know, that was kind of that was kind of pish posh. Uh, as we develop our own ideas and continue to, you know, flex the huge American war machine muscle. Well, I mean, I think that the, the the interesting case to look at, you know, given your upcoming deployment, is actually of the Russian aerospace forces in Syria. You know, if you think back to when it began, which was September 2015, the the instant reaction was was that they were getting themselves involved in a quagmire, and then it it, it steadily shifted into they may not be in a quagmire. But they've shown clear deficiencies in how they operate. And there's been less of a focus, I think, on the on the things that they do well. And I think one of the things that they do well is is how they've kept their presence pretty narrow, particularly on the aerospace force side, and has achieved you know, both military and political effects um, with that air power. That is something that is interesting to me um, and, and I, I know is interesting to you. So why don't you just pick it up there? Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating, the VKS's capability to fight a limited war. Um, I think we're kind of, you know, we're a little bit deficient in that, but they're 100% able to move forces rapidly into the country um, and then aggressively employ those in a fairly aggressive uh, manner. I mean, some would say it's cavalier, right? We'll, we'll get to a point where we talk about some of the differences in ROE and the manner in which they employ uh, different, different portions uh, of their force. But really, it's a matter of their ability to, to move them in and quickly and rapidly turn them. I mean, there, there are reference, references in between 2015 and 2018 where they're moving a Su-35S uh, cutting-edge fighter jet in, turning it in less than 72 hours, and employing it uh, in combat, um, you know, in, in one way or another. Yeah, you know, and, and it's, it's fascinating to, to think about because when you, when you listen to sort of how we talk about ourselves, that's something that we pride ourselves on, which is this idea that you can have basically a jet anywhere in the world within 48 hours and you can turn it around within 12 or 24. You can correct me on my hours if I'm slightly off here and begin to immediately go towards combat operations. And I think the assumptions before Syria was that the Russians weren't expeditionary and that they couldn't do these things and, and, and clearly they can't. Yeah, and I think in a limited footprint, um, they're absolutely able to do it. I think if they had to move a massive force 
they would still uh, have some problems as far as the logistics and stuff go. But as far as modern conflict goes, that they, they can move the forces that they need to. Uh, I'm not going to update your, your time or correct your, your days uh, just for the sake of classification. But they were able to rapidly move those things. And we absolutely beat our chest about the ability to move uh, forces into theater rapidly. But there's a huge difference between what we do on a regular basis and what they did um, especially the first initial moves was one was uh, the world was kind of looking another way and they didn't expect it, which, you know, we've kind of made our movements germane to the different locations that we do it. So they, they have the uh, element of surprise just based upon their historic norms and the way that they've operated. Um, but then they, they rapidly move those things in and they set them up at a place that they'd never had uh, equipment before, right? There are obviously political ties. There were certainly some logistical support that they received from the host nation, if I may. Um, uh, and then um, and then they were able to set that set up rapidly in that way. And they had a limited footprint, right? So they're not bringing in an entire squadron all at once and expecting all of them to fly a sortie the following 24 hours or something like that. Uh, but they knew that, and they they really their goal was was more working in the information domain and really focusing on information operations to go, hey, look, we can do this real fast. You didn't expect us to, and here's the shock and awe that comes from that really just uh, that headline for them. I, I think one of the interesting things here is that you so you touched on it is they had a mixed aviation regiment from the beginning, you know. So it it doesn't appear to me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it, it's ever a full squadron of one type of aircraft. They, they they were really mixing and matching, you know, depending upon what they think they need. Again, I find that fascinating because it, it's a clever way to go about doing this stuff. You know, you never want to like come off as being too sort of you know, giving too much praise, but it is a clever way to do this. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I think. Um I don't think the Russians really plan for jointness. We certainly do, and we 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 tout ourselves on that. But the ability to move um, surface air missile systems, as well as uh, different types of fighters, and then some of the the heavy uh, assets, especially in the midst of the you know things that are going on in Ukraine, the support has to go there, and the limited logistics that they have from that to support their Aleutian fleet. Um, they were still able to do all that, and obviously they did some fairly clever stuff with. Uh, with IL-76s and, and moving, um, you know, different fighters in conjunction with those folks to move them into theater so that we couldn't necessarily see how that was being done. Um, so that was, that was fairly interesting how that was all done. And they were able to put all those things at the same place, which uh, significantly reduces your command and control network requirements, which ours is huge, and it's a, it's a huge uh, burden, per se, to get through all the different messages and how that information is going to be passed from unit to unit you know, the three that I just mentioned are through really four. If you talk about the, the Su-34 fullbacks and the Su-35s that are flying around there on a pretty regular basis in conjunction with other strike and attack platforms, the SAMs, and then the, um, and then the other um, really ground support forces that are going on there can be a huge burden. If you put them all in the same place, life gets a lot simpler. Now, I will absolutely uh, just play the devil's advocate in the fact that if you put all your eggs in one basket, it's pretty easy for your enemy to metaphorically tip over that basket but for the sake of the russians they kind of knew that that wouldn't happen based upon the way that they were basing and you know some of the the political travesties that would occur if uh, somebody decided to say hey you kinetically say uh, hey this is enough of that yeah i mean it is logistically easier let's say where you can move both your command and control you, know, you can consolidate your command and control at one place but also the logistics tail that you would need to supply these people knowing that they would be unmolested, right? So in that respect, that makes it easier to carry out. But that's an assumption that was that they could quite clearly take into the, in, into the fight with them because they could assume quite rationally is that nobody would take offensive action against them because of the, the, the consequences of escalation. So nobody really wants to escalate with Russia over a conflict in Syria. Oh, certainly. I mean, and Aaron, you talk about logistics. I think a lot of their force is suited for um, low-end logistics, if I may. So we have fighters, we have uh, advanced, you know, long-range standoff munitions. We have a lot of uh, JDAM and things that require significant work. 
um, you know, to make all those things happen. They have very simple systems. All of them are fourth generation. So, you know, putting a Raptor, putting an F-35 in theater has a huge, uh, a huge logistical support footprint. Um, you know, and so uh, that kind of stuff that going on for them makes their logistics a lot simpler as well. I mean, and they did some of the things that we certainly didn't steal from them. We were almost doing it simultaneously was carrying weapons into theater on the platforms and then flying sorties with them, you know, uh, within a, a fairly short period of time, as opposed to counting on, um, you know, uh, wide body aircraft, moving them in heavy lift to get those things done or, or a lot of times, um, you know, counting on ships or ground transport for some of the weapons that you would end up employing in theater. They keep things simple and they move them in very quickly as well. They're, there's a lot of things the Russians do to make their lives simpler that we just can't. Um, and we can talk through some of those just later as far as employment stuff. So, yeah. So th there's a couple of things that we have to acknowledge here um, to even to, to maintain our credibility. One of which is, is uh, the, the level of precision to which the Russians have to employ is far lower than ours. Right. solely based upon the rules of engagement, right? So they can bring these these dumb bombs, for lack of a better term, ballistic free-fall munitions that don't go uh, to a specific coordinate to keep the innocent safe uh, and to and to strike a no-kidding valid military target. They just don't do that. So yeah. there's there's a whole host of things that, that, that becomes far easier for them um, when those types of things happen, right? In addition to that, when I, when I reference kind of the command and control networks, that are required to satisfy rules of engagement for the coalition, whether it's NATO or a ad hoc alliance of partnerships, you know, in, in any conflict, not nonetheless the middle in the Middle East and CENTCOM, um, it's, it can be very challenging. You know, we are extremely well connected in order to satisfy some of those uh, target engagement authorities, the TEA as we call it. Um, and, and that obviously slows us down. Like everyone knows that and our enemy uses it against them. Whereas, uh, multiple accounts, you know, I could, I could run out of all the ear in my lungs uh, talking about the things the Russians have done that is completely unsatisfactory humanitarian travesties, uh, that have occurred, but it's that they don't, it, they don't care, right? They have goals, they accomplish them and then they're, they're able to chase those down. So you can bed down quickly. And if you don't have to talk to anyone, flying an airplane is really, really easy. I could, I could tell you from experience, uh, your life gets a lot simpler, but you're far less effective, um, mm -hmm. on, on a small tactical scale and definitely on a strategic scale. When, you know, you look at Aleppo and you go, Oh boy, uh, that was not a great idea. Uh, and we, we could never have done something like that and, and lived on the global scale, but just based upon the way the Russians look at the world and, and what their goals were, uh, they can certainly go through with uh, atrocities like that. That's exactly right. And in some respects, of course, you know, the devil's advocate to our conversation is that for everything you just said is why we shouldn't be like them, right? Yeah. Or, or even take steps to mimic or – mimic is not the right term – to incorporate some of the sort of <laughs> – non-war crimey things that they do. And I think what we're talking about here is if you step back to like the summer of 2015 and you begin to see construction at um, Hamim, uh, Hamim Air Base, you know, I think what we're talking about here is the ability for them to take what was an incomplete air base, right? Which yes, had, had their proper runway space, but it was still relatively incomplete put in assets and then turn around and go quickly to begin striking targets and able to maintain that high operational tempo. And I, I'm not sure going into this, if we assumed, if, if we really had a grasp that they could do these things, you know, I don't want to get you in trouble with any type of classification things, but like, it's my understanding is that like the way that they operate kind of raise some eyebrows in terms of their effectiveness as an air force in ways that we didn't quite think or, or, or at least think that they would operate like this before 2015. I, I would completely agree with you, Aaron. I mean, I will still say this, that unequivocally the United States Air Force employs air to ground munitions better than any Air Force on the entire planet, quantifiably, right? Yeah. Um, however, comma, we thought that we were, were looking at a whole bunch of, of quote-unquote near peer, and that's the last time I'll use that, our, our peer – uh, enemy and going, there's no way these, these folks can do that kind of a thing. Right. And then 
they started they started regularly and logistics I will continue to stress is the hardest portion of this they started to regularly load weapons employ them um, didn't have the maintenance issues that we would we would regularly see with building weapons building bombs loading them employing them you know hitting something uh, whether it's the target they wanted to or not and they were reg- able to regularly do that and um, and then adapt right so they'd find things that were wrong logistically they'd find things wrong with their uh, weapon deployment tactics and things like that and they they change and they learn you know which is completely against kind of what the rest of us thought was going on inside of the VKS of um, this this conscript force that does what they're told uh, kind of a thing whereas they go out and do these types of things and they, they regularly employ them and their weapons I mean the, the weapons do kind of what we thought they were going to do to speak in generalities for the sake of classification mm-hmm. um, but then that they would they would actually launch these things you know long range standoff type of stuff the that, caliber yeah absolutely absolutely the other thing that I'm interested in is, and I'm not sure how much of this was intentional. In fact, I don't think much of this was intentional at all, um, with one exception, which is that their introduction of platforms forced us, or at least prompted us, I wouldn't say forced, it prompted us to make counter moves to counter what they had put in, right? So I'm, I'm talking here about the Su-35, right? We had to put in systems or, or, or aircraft to counter the Su-35, but that came with costs, Right, and so I'm talking here about the F-22, but ultimately because the Russians installed S-400 into Syria, is that that became a trade-off in and of itself, right? And so that beyond just their ability to rapidly get aircraft into a place, turn those aircraft around, and then use those use those those munitions, how they use those munitions relatively effectively. Again, not necessarily from always hitting their targets, but from a uh, um, a, a political effects based outcomes were, were generally positive in their um, um, calculations of the terms, but also how they forced us to kind of move around a little bit. And I think that that's an interesting part that always gets overlooked is that like they forced us to kind of move to, 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 to change how we operate. And that's something that, that I just don't think we can be overlooked. I think you're right. I think there's a lot to that. There's, there's so many layers of what was going on there, you know, to steal a term from one of my favorite movies, he's communicating, you know, so they're actually exchanging words uh, politically, right? So they move those assets into theater via the Su-35S and, you know, or C if you're speaking in Cyrillic. Um, so, and, and none of us can stand toe-to-toe, none of us in the fortune world. So the United States is forced. I don't want to stop you there, but can you make that point for yeah. people who don't follow this? Because there's this tendency to downplay the Russians because like, they may not have the cutting-edge technology that we do. But the Su-35 yeah. is a badass plane, man. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. that's a it, good fighter. It, it's a, it is a great airplane. I, I completely uh, honor that fighter. Um, I mean, I'd say it gives the Eagle a run for its money. I'm sure people can argue with that. And there's, there's a million ways you can quantify that we're better. And there's a million ways to quantify that we're worse. But uh, you, you have to respect that system and the weapons that it can carry and the, the radar it has on the front end, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as well as the way it's, it's data linked, really. Some, some of the command and control um, nodes that it can collect from and, and gather information and situational awareness for it to shoot airplanes out of the sky is very good. Um, so then you, you kind of have to honor that with something better, right? Like you got, I, I see your Su-35S and I raise you a Raptor, right? And until, uh, until you get to a point where you know, this is deterrence at its finest, you know they don't have the will, the Russians don't have the will to use it um, the way that it would have to be used to, to hurt somebody pretty badly, right? So you say, okay, you want to bring a Su-35 in, we're going to bring a Raptor in. We're going to sit here and establish a norm, and that norm is you're just going to fly in circles over here, very, very, very close, and sometimes in the same circles that we are, and then we're going to fly in our circles over here and do our job. There will be times that conflict will occur, but it won't be in aerial combat on a regular basis at, at that level, right? Um, because because by the time that an engagement is occurring, it the Raptor has lost its advantage, right? It's They're on top of each other, so the stealthiness and that kind of essay and stuff – um, so it's it, it it's not the way that you would expect the two to be there, but that's at the tactical level, right? So you, you break it down that they had to do that, and then once the norms have been established, you don't necessarily need a Raptor to fly circles around an F-35, or excuse me, my mistake, a Su-35, uh, 
protein slip, uh, Su-35, uh, any more than you need, a, need an F-15E to do that. So that, that's one part of the puzzle, you know, and, and then and as things moved on, and this is, you know, something you, you allude to a lot of is, like, they got us to bring a Raptor into theater, yeah. and they were able to collect sensitive intelligence, and they're brilliant at doing electronic attack um, and electronic warfare and electronic surveillance. And so they were able to do that. Obviously, we have ways to protect ourselves, but um, uh, again, speaking generality, so that's certainly to their advantage. And they were, you know, using air to ground systems in the same way to collect those things. But those are those power moves, right? And Russia, I think, they're great at operational art, and they're really great at uh, reflexive control, right? So they're going to set a scene, an information scene, and in, in, in operations the information environment, and get you to do things that you would want to do, but they are a hundred percent what they wanted you to do, right? So you see something, you're like, okay, I have to do this, and you're almost compelled, a uh, matter of compellence to do something, vis-a-vis bring a raptor in the theater, um, and then and then they get what they want, which is you know some sensitive intelligence and collection, and then they also, as a byproduct, look fairly dominant that they have started to, for lack of a better term, call the shots, uh, which which makes it pretty tough. Which uh, this is not me saying I love the Russian government, but you have to admire some of the steps and moves that they make, just being aggressive in warfare. So I'm catching my breath because the flip side to this too is that they brought an S-400 into Syria and we were in Syria too and so it, it was a trade-off I'm not sure who wins that trade-off <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure yeah yeah <laughs> I think we have good stuff now, too yeah you're absolutely right um, I think the S-400 trade-off was more again showing some of the muscle flex right like as yeah. far as them planning to use it that'd be a pretty bold move and uh, they would they would kind of be the the bad roommate, right? You'd want them they'd want them out of the apartment if they started shooting missiles off the S four hundred S, because it and all its surrounding power structure and runway and you know everything would get annihilated. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So like we knew that that wasn't going to happen because it'd be it'd be political suicide and everybody would have to they'd kick all the roommates out um, and 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 the Syrians would probably ask the Russians to leave after we decided to level that place. Uh, but you, we didn't really know uh, if they were going to take the steps with the Su-35, right? Like the S-400 was just kind of, we're going to put this here so you don't shoot us. And so that if we throw weapons inbound, um, you know, that thing would try to shoot some of those weapons down as well, which was kind of half their battle. Right. So bringing this full circle, the things that, that, that I think about, when I watch what, when I reflect, you know, again, six years later, right? Like they've been in there for a while, uh, I guess five and a half years, but you, you get the point. Um, mm-hmm. What would we steal? And I think the thing that I would steal is that when you, when you look around at sort of the broader planning going on within the Air Force, it, it's an exciting time, again, as an analyst, as an outsider, you know, because, because of peer adversaries. This is no longer flying circles over Afghanistan. This is, you know, you know thinking about really hard problems. And them moving in to sort of a half-built air base and being able to turn around more quickly with a simplified command and control sounds a lot like some of the things I hear about we would need for the Asia-Pacific region or the Indo-Pacific region. Like That may be too simple. It's, it, 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 it makes some sense to me. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. No, I, I would 100% agree with that. And if you ask the question, what would I, what would I quote on steel, whether it's intellectually or or physically, sometimes I think at the at the strategic level, it's the initiative, right? So I think the initiative and then and, and being ready to move um, and develop strategy that's predicated upon being able to land anywhere we want and set set things up, right? I mean, that's agile combat employment um, at its finest, to be cliche at this point, but to do that very quickly, right? And then operationally, at the operational level of warfare. I would want the ability to fight a campaign from a single runway and be able to make decisions rapidly and more quickly. You know, if we move this thing over here, that works. Our enemy maneuvered like this. In this case, I'm speaking as a Russian. Our enemy, the United States, did this thing. Okay, I, now I want to move this one more thing. And an operational level commander can go, hey, uh, I need a fullback, a Su-34, to come over here, and I need another... Um, tactical surface terror missile defense system, right? And then I think um, to kind of to continue walk 
walk all the way through this thought is is at the tactical level of war, I would want um, just a little less uh, um, I guess uh, I'm going to choose my words very carefully uh, uh, just less handcuffs on my tactical employment of a weapon right? Uh, I'm not talking about war crimes here but I am talking about moving very quickly through the target engagement authority to be able to move things move things up rapidly uh, Mm -hmm. to employ weapons and and they do that you know and they I'm not going to pretend um well, I'll pretend not to know for in this conversation uh, how their actual doctrine and command and control works, but like it, it just seemed to move more quickly to engage in the targets that they wanted to, um, as opposed to waiting for uh, high high level commanders to to make those choices. So that'd be kind of the things that we do. But and those are all the things; those are key tenets in this agile combat employment that we're that we're getting after. Now, I mean, Aaron, we talk about uh, doing things in the Pacific, so it's it's an entire different ball game, right? Like if we're playing, uh, if we're playing soccer or uh, European football um, in, in the Middle East, this is an entire game of rugby, right? Like it's just continually moving in the Pacific uh, to find some of those things together. But the, some of the same ideas apply. I think you're hundred percent right. Is that we would go out um, and we need, we need to move and we need to move quickly to a place that we don't have a ton of support for. Right. I mean, you, you make a great point that we, you, we talk about this bear base that they moved to, but really they were they did a lot of fortification. And that's some of the fortification that we're going to have to make to a series of places. Um, you know, so then it's even more challenging to take our logistical support away because um, you don't, the goal is to convince people that they don't know where the United States is going to move, just like the Russians. Nobody knew where the Russians were going to go to. They just happened to be making some investments and in logistical support to an airfield, uh, and then they, they capitalized on that. So we have to we have to start making some of those investments in random places. And people go, well, they're just you know doing some some diplomacy and setting this this third world nation up or this tiny little baby island uh, with a little bit more of a runway so it can land, you know, whatever a seven fifty seven on it to deliver baby milk and COVID vaccines. Uh, and that's where we have to start tying in some of these other instruments of war, I think, is what the Russians have been doing so well to go, oh, yeah, what are, what are you doing over here? Oh, that's right. Moving six to 12 hard line fighters into a, a location nobody expected them before. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, this, you know, it's such a broad question to bring up at the end of the podcast, but like some of the sort of constraints that you're talking about, I think are enabled by advances in our own technology. You know, certain things that we have that they don't have may actually make their lives simpler, even if it makes the effectiveness of a single weapon on sort of the pointy end of the spear less effective. Do you know what I'm saying? And so it's almost like trying to unwind some of the systems that we purpose built that give us this technological overmatch. I think that's the challenge. And that's the challenge I don't really have a good answer for because you don't want to give away your technological overmatch, but that technological overmatch is in some ways making your logistics very difficult and is in other ways making those target engagement authorities more constraining. And again, I, I do wonder how you fix that or, 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 or how you mold that in ways that, that incorporate some of these lessons learned Again, I hate to use lessons learned because there's no lessons. <laughs> some of the um, some of the aggressive moves that the Russians make that we both find fascinating, and 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 and, and um, from an intellectual standpoint, because we think that they have some merit to in, to. <laughs> this is really difficult to say <laughs> because they they bomb schools. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just just some of the aggressive things that they do, which we think we can incorporate to make ourselves even better. Okay, so Aaron, you, you unpacked a series of, of large knowledge boulders there uh, in the midst of that conversation. And and I, uh, you know, as a father of three, I'm going to refuse to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, we're going to throw out the bathwater of the crimes against humanity while simultaneously keeping uh, the baby that is all the all the simple technologies and the things they've been able to do. I think the things that we need to take out of this 
Um, our one, our, our acquisition process is certainly broken. Nobody's going, going to say that, that, that it isn't. There aren't things that we could do better. Um, and I'm not even going to try to solve that in this, this podcast. But I will say that requirements management is something um, that we're kind of bad at. What we call in the industry of acquisitions gold plating is making something better than it really needs to be. Um, and we are, are uh, 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 we are our own worst enemy when that happens, right? We have the best engineers on the planet. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, they're out there and they work for us and it's awesome and they're still striving to make our, our world better. Um, but they want to make our world a lot, a lot, a lot better, right? Um, without without paying attention to um, what we call measures of sustainability, which means how do you get it there? How do you keep it fresh? How do you get it on the jet? You know, how do you keep it from um, with the right codes and crypto and that kind of stuff going on? And we have to really start to focus on those, which are really unimpressive and, and really hard to test. And nobody likes to. They like to see the bomb go boom and, you know, slice through the center of a, you know, center of a, um, an NF-150 at 70 miles an hour. But they don't want to be like, whoa, where's the crypto for that weapon? And how long does it take to be loaded? And how often does it have to be ops checked? And who's the specialist? You know, this one phd in the entire world that can actually calibrate that weapon so those are some of the things that we really have to infuse and bake into our acquisition process for the rest of that and then and then really that's one portion of it the other portion of it i think is um is culture right like we have this culture that's grown up over the last 20 years um now and it, it started to sneak in before um the planes hit the towers but of having this very centralized command and control network uh, and that culture is is predicated upon trust, right? And there, we don't have to have a lot of trust when there's this centralized command and control. And so these people kind of have to push those things down. And that's just training people to kind of be afraid and training t- people to be creative and aggressive. And I know that's kind of like leadership cliches, but it's no, it's, it's not, especially you know, because of how they. It, it really is hyper. It really is hyper um, centralized. You don't want to screw up, and make a mistake. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you personally, from some of my leadership experiences, I'm like, I want somebody to tell me how to do something more. But then I'm like, wait a minute, and I'm completely being a hypocrite when it comes to executing with the general vision of what's going on, which is easier said than done. And we've done some things to walk through those and we can spend five podcasts walking through that one later. But those are those are some of the things that I would take away from uh, what the Russians have done, really how they build their things. And really, they don't they don't do that on purpose. Like they don't acquire things and be like, Oh, how easy would this be to put into the middle East at a hundred degrees with no support around it? It's just as good as they can make it. And it happens to be utter garbage trash that can live anywhere and doesn't require a PhD because they have like four PhDs in the entire country. Yes. I know that's, that's ethnocentric. I'm being sarcastic at that point. I mean, I guess the last thing I would say here on like sort of the, the way to really, really stitch it together is I, I really do feel like we're at the front end of something. You know, I, I, I feel like we were at the front end of a lot of big rethinks about how we operate. You know, if you kind of define the Cold War era, then you have the interwar era, and I would date this back to about 2011, but really 2014 uh, with the Russian invasion of Crimea and the concurrent sort of Chinese evolution to where it, it's it's reached peer adversary status so if we're thinking about projecting to the future do you, do you think the air force is on there i mean that's not a good question to ask you but like do you think that the like, like like some of these things about being more agile getting less centralized are becoming more mainstream or are or, or, or we sort of the crazy people speaking into a podcast and we're gonna get laughed at on all these um uh, facebook groups I think everything that we're talking about is 100% in the mainstream. I mean, the fact that the United States Air Force has stood up an exercise called Agile Flag uh, is 100% saying that this is important that we do this. Um, the the thing that people are going to laugh at us about now and then maybe in 10 years they'll be like, oh, man, we really should have paid attention is we have to now honor our enemies as peers, right? And we have to go, okay – there's things we do great and there's things we do bad. The things we do bad, let's look over there and go, ooh, they do that pretty good. Let's take that page from their playbook. You know, leave the other 99 pages of bombing innocent civilians someplace else, but take that page and, and take it with us, right? Because we're entering a phase in our nation's history, at least military history, of, I'd say, peer gray zone competition. Um, and, I, and we can't continue to say that we're in the front running anymore, definitely in all the, the national power, instruments of power. Um, 
but certainly in the military. And then we have to realize that we're in this competition and we can stay, uh, whether we like it or not, we have to stay agile in order to avoid crossing some of those red lines, even though some people might be crossing them for us. Right. Um, so that's what I'd say. Well, with that, uh, Mule, thanks for, uh, uh, joining me and engaging in blasphemy with just talking about some of the lessons that we can learn from our adversaries. Uh, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I love it. Uh, nobody ever changed the world by following the rules. So <laughs> happy to help Aaron. Let me know the next time we can sit down and chat. Anytime. And uh, good luck on the deployment. I appreciate it. It'll be fun. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Chain Reaction. Be sure to subscribe to Chain Reaction on iTunes and Spotify, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at the handle at FPRI. Chain Reaction is a podcast of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank in Philadelphia. For more information about this and other initiatives, be sure to visit www.fpri.org. 